much. Thanks for the uh, opportunity. And it's great to be part of uh, this team coming to it, this issue from very diff many different directions. So I, uh, I'm <clears throat> going to look at the how we can deal with the consequences of PTSD. And uh, I, I, there may be some implications in the long term for prevention, but mostly I'm going to talk about what we know about treatments, particularly the role of serotonin in those treatments and how we can utilize serotonergic agents to help people recover from PTSD. So here's uh, my declarations of interests. Um, and this is just a very simple schema that I put together 20 years ago now to, to help me think about my research. I, when I started to work in PTSD, I wanted to have a, a conceptual schema that I could, could work with easily. And, um, and this is it. I think you've seen more elaborate versions of this in some of the other presentations. But I, I just wanted it very simple. And um, I mean, clearly people get traumatized uh, and you have to detect the trauma. And there's some very interesting data we haven't got time to go into about the influence of being intoxicated or head injured, uh, altering the detection and the encoding of trauma. The de that detection goes through a series uh, of different um, perceptual organs, but in the end, they all work through glutamate uh, to lay down the memories. And, and the, that memory is actually laid down by a, a parallel inhibition of GABA to allow glutamate to produce long-term potentiation. But on the left-hand side here, you've, you've got two separate elements of the trauma. You've got the perception of the trauma, knowing it happened, you've got, and the registration. And that registration contains, essentially lays down the memory. And that memory, there are two elements of the memory. There's the factual memory, what happened. And that's very much encoded by glutamate. But we've got less good evidence for this. But to some extent, there is evidence that the emotional elements of the memory are encoded both by noradrenaline yeah. Okay, do you hear me all right? Yeah. And then, of course, there's a stress response. Um, so I'm going to focus on serotonin for the uh, purposes of today, but there's a very interesting parallel talk on noradrenaline, although less good research on it. So what do we know about serotonin in PTSD? Well, we know a certain amount empirically. We know the SSRIs and MAOIs and some tricyclics can be helpful. And there are guidelines such as the BAP guidelines uh, that, that give you uh, some indications how to use them. We know that tryptophan depletion, reducing serotonin, will undermine the therapeutic effect of, uh, of these drugs. <laughs> If Dr. Ryan can, can mute his microphone, please. You need persistence of the serotonin elevation to maintain wellness. We know that uh, drugs which, like quetiapine, which improves sleep, may possibly work through 5 c 2 receptor blockade. Not proven. That's how they improve sleep. It's possible. We know that if you stimulate the the 5-HT system through agonists like MCPP, people can get worse. And I'm going to finish by talking about MDMA, because that's the very exciting new area. MDMA, which is a prototypical serotonin releaser, has been, is being resurrected now uh, as a treatment for PTSD. So let me just briefly rehearse some of these data. This is a study that um, we published in 2008, which was, I think, the first study looking at the role of serotonin in PTSD uh, in people who've been treated with SSRIs. So these are <coughs> individuals. The study was done by Korchak in, um, in Sao Paulo. And uh, he treated a number of people. You can see the individual data here. Uh, he'd been traumatized uh, with SSRIs. He got them well. And then he put them through a challenge paradigm. And the challenge paradigm was an autobiographical challenge, which is a very well-established uh, way of eliciting a recurrence of symptoms in people with PTSD. It's a specialization. <laughs> and you see here, there are two peaks. This peak is the, uh, what happens when you put these recovered people to a challenge, a memory challenge, uh, in the normal state on placebo. And this is what happens if you deplete their serotonin. There is, in almost everyone, a significant increase in the 
subjective experience on the uh, Davidson trauma scale following tryptophan depletion. So this is good evidence that serotonin is somehow maintaining or part of the therapeutic mechanism of SSRIs. Um, it doesn't eliminate the response to the traumatic memory, but it certainly helps attenuate it because the, the, the magnitude is greater if you deplete the brain of serotonin. And in fact, we um, obviously we went to look at the different symptomatologies, if the different symptom clusters in PTSD, and you can see that uh, on the right hand here, all three of the uh, symptom clusters, which were part of the diagnosis at the time, um, were worsened in the acute tryptophan depletion, the ATD condition. And here's just the overall data. So it's a, a very significant um, uh, worsening of of the um, impact of the traumatic reliving if you have removed serotonin from your brain or de depleted serotonin. And it fits with a whole spectrum of other uh, pieces of data that suggests that serotonin has a, a powerful role to attenuate stress reactivity. In fact, one of the things we subsequently did was collate our PTSD data with similar data we had gathered in other fear-like disorders, such as panic and social anxiety disorder. And all those three disorders uh, show the same response. If you are recovered on an SSRI, you are protected against the provocation, whether it's a, a, a pharmacological challenge in panic, a, a, a social exposure challenge in social anxiety, or the min memory challenge in PTSD, you're protected by the drugs, the medicines, and that protection is attenuated by uh, depleting the brain of serotonin. And um, that's not true in OCD and it's not true in GAD. So it suggests that there are differences between those um, anxiety disorders. And, it, and this I think is a, an interesting model because it supports the idea that there are fear disorders which are perhaps more serotonin sensitive than other anxiety disorders where serotonin agents may work, but possibly in a slightly different way. But this raises a fundamental question if a serotonin is necessary to help press and fear, then. Um, uh, the uh, hang on one second because I need to. Um, there you go, Matt. There you go, David. I unmuted you by accident. There you go. No trouble. So decreasing 5-HT increases the fear responses, so will increasing 5-HT reduce them? And that was, that's really the core of this talk. Now, the most obvious way of acutely increasing serotonin is using MDMA. There it is. It's a, an amphetamine type um, compound that powerfully releases um, serotonin. Here you see brain dialysis data in rats showing increases in serotonin. It also releases hormones such as a, a arginine vasopressin and also oxytocin. And oxytocin itself might be quite a useful hormone in relation to dampening down stress. And of course, as you all know, that people who use MDMA, usually in the form of ecstasy, they report positive mood effects, and uh, many people use it to self medicate depression, um, where it can have a transient beneficial effect. Actually, David, if I may interrupt, is there a, a correlation between oxytocin release and serotonin release, or are they separate from each other in, 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 in response to MDMA? No, I don't. In the human, well, actually, the answer is don't know in humans because we can't, we've not yet done the MDMA serotonin release experiment in humans it's just about doable but we haven't got funding for it in animals i'm not sure anyone has done that I don't, i'm not sure we know it is a serotonergic effect because we can block the oxytocin release with serotonergic antagonists but i don't i don't know how well it correlates what i can tell you is and i haven't i've deleted that slide so i'll tell you now is that there isn't any relationship in our hands between the brain imaging effects and the subjective effects of oxytocin, uh, of MDMA and oxytocin release. Oxytocin, however, is though quite a challenging plasma oxytocin may not best measure uh, or um, best 
equate to brain oxytocin and it's also a very hard assay so you get a lot of variability so it's hard to hard to prove that oxytocin is a mediator of the effects of mdma but it's also it's hard to disprove it too So on this image here, you see the front cover of the British Journal of Psychiatry, normally a very conservative uh, academic journal, and it's gone psychedelic for the first time in its life. And, and, and those two people are it's the central people in the story of MDMA becoming a therapeutic agent. So the, the man is a Sasha Shul, Alexander Shulgin, and there's his wife. And, um, and there's the molecule. Uh, in their hand. And Shilgin uh, was the chemist who worked for the uh, Drug Enforcement Agency in the States who made their standards so that they could identify what the police and the DEA uh, operatives collected from people and then prove that they were illegal. Uh, as all good chemists did, uh, Shilgin tested all the compounds he made and he wrote about it in his notes and he turned his notes into uh, several books. And uh, his notes on MDMA are remarkable because having tested hundreds of different amphetamine derivatives, he commented that, that, that MDMA was rather different. It was rather better than the others. And it had a very positive, empathetic, in, empathy-inducing effects. So he asked his wife to try it. And his wife said, wow, this is amazing. This is a, a pro-empathy drug. In fact, they called it empathy. And she was a psychotherapist. And she began to use it and began to, they began to, it was legal in those days, she began to give it to her friends who were also psychotherapists. And it became quite popular in what we call couples counselling. Because you know, MDMA administered before a couple session could help couples basically shed off all the sort of years of uh, irritation and anger with each other and actually get back to being in love and actually dealing with the... Uh, their issues in a much more positive uh, rather than negative way. And uh, it was seen as a major breakthrough in terms of psychotherapy. And this article, or this, the, this front page, emerged because of an article that uh, I wrote with Ben Sessa, uh, who um, has been pioneering uh, the resurrection of drugs like MDMA uh, as medicines. And um, it's, uh, there's now been quite a bit of data coming together to support this view. Uh, it's also worth remembering that the, um, uh, the reason that MDMA became illegal was not because it was being used psychotherapeutically, but because it was being used recreationally. And it, was a, it was a legal drug, and it was a legal stimulant, and it was, in order to encourage people to use it, its name was changed from empathy to ecstasy, that made it very popular, but it also made it a target of the media and politicians, and that's why it got made illegal, because there's nothing that politicians and newspaper owners hate more than young people having ecstasy. And one of the problems with the banning of ecstasy was that there had to be justification for it. You, could, you couldn't simply say, we don't like you having fun. Uh, and so um, hysteria was created around the... Uh, possible possibility that ecstasy caused brain damage and, and some of the worst science in the history of psychopharmacology was uh, produced to try to cause to try to show that ecstasy caused brain damage in fact it doesn't and what's great is that in the last 10 years we have everything has flipped up to 10 years ago any symposium in a major international conference like this would have been trying to convince the world that ecstasy caused brain damage now, 10 years on, we're actually looking at how ecstasy can heal the brain. Uh, and that has been driven um, in part by this, the rising need to help deal with the problem of PTSD, particularly war-induced PTSD. So there on the left, you have an American soldier avoiding drowning because he's hanging on to this ecstasy tablet. And the drivers for this are not just the fact that PTSD is very unpleasant and very damaging, because largely governments don't really care about that. That's why they engage in war. But um, on, like on the right-hand side, in a, uh, this image from Aleppo, but we've now got this interesting situation where in the US, more soldiers kill themselves than are killed by the enemy. And that's actually not a very good commendation for people to join the army. 
And the field has changed dramatically. Here's an, a paper a picture from a Guardian magazine just a year or so ago. Uh, it's become widely talked about as a therapeutic agent in relation to PTSD. So why is that? Well, the, lar the, the initial driver for this is this amazing study by Michael and Annie Mithoffer. These are two psychotherapists from the States who did the first controlled trial of MDMA for PTSD. They took individuals who had treatment resistant PTSD. They'd failed on at least two other treatments, including medicine, including psychotherapy. They put them through a long session. It was a 16 week exposure therapy, um, series of exposure therapy sessions. But twice in that period of 16 weeks, they did the exposure under either MDMA or placebo. The dose of MDMA they used was relatively high, over 100 milligrams. And, um, and the effects lasted uh, for many hours and were actually quite challenging for people. But I think all the participants were able to, to cope with exposure under MDMA. And you can see the impact of that was profound, particularly after the first dose. So you see here, three to five days after the first MDMA session, their CAP scores reduced very dramatically. In fact, this line here is the threshold for being well. So you can see that they went from being quite ill to being within the normal range after one single exposure of MDMA. And then the second exposure gave some further improvement. And then there was continued improvement subsequently. And the placebo group also did quite well. Our 16 week exposure therapy is more than quite a lot of people with PTSD get. Uh, so there is, a, there is efficacy in the standard therapy, but MDMA dramatically accelerated both the speed and the magnitude of that response. And this paper was published nearly 10 years ago now. And they've obviously then had time to do a follow-up. And here you see the latest follow-up data that's been published where you've got a mean of nearly four years long-term follow-up and you've got this improvement in the CAP scores persisting. So this is almost like they've kind of, these, most of these people have had their PTSD removed. They're not, they're not continuing to take MDMA. They're not continuing a psychotherapy. They've got better and they've stayed well. And somehow their brain has reset so that they are no longer experiencing those uh, intrusive memories, which of a disabling feature of PTSD. And because of that, we've now seen back translation. And, uh, you've already heard something of the work of, of, of Kerry Ressler, and they've now shown that you can use MDMA in animals and get benefit in PTSD models of animals. So this is a very powerful uh, way of proving that the human data is actually scientifically meaningful. If you can replicate it in a rat, it must be true. So what's going on? Well, a few years ago, we decided to do what turned out to be the first real study of MDMA on brain function using brain imaging. And it was a very challenging study to do because MDMA is a, a schedule one class A drug in Britain. It's controlled in the most severe way, even though it's not remotely as harmful as other schedule one drugs like heroin or fentanyl or, or um, or methamphetamine, but we managed to get permissions and funding to do the study. And we, uh, I'm gonna show you these data, because these data talk to the explanation as to why MDMA may be useful in the treatment of PTSD. So the first thing we discovered was that if you look at the amygdala, which as you've heard already in the talks today is a, a key node in the generation of fear responses, there is an attenuation of amygdala activity. The amygdala cerebral blood flow goes down and the more it goes down, the greater the impact of MDMA. So some of the effects of MDMA can be explained in terms of turning off the uh, activity of the amygdala, which is what you would kind of want in a treatment of a disorder which is associated with amygdala hyperreactivity, as is PTSD. And uh, there's also other groups, particularly the Harriet DeWitt's group in Chicago and, and um, 
the group in Zurich, Wallenweider and Co., that's shown that MDMA dampens down amygdala responses to fearful faces in the same way as SSRIs do. So this all fits with the idea that MDMA can dampen down the fear circuit. But we were quite interested in the question of the interaction between MDMA and memories. So what we did in our imaging study was we got the individuals to come up with um, six positive memories and six negative memories. We didn't, they didn't tell us what they were because we didn't want to be embarrassed by them and we didn't want them to be embarrassed by telling us. But they made the list and then on the placebo day, we asked them to recall three of those memories, you know, one, six, and three. And on the other day, the other three. And so we, and each memory was triggered by a name. So it was easy for them to remember, like holiday, like marriage or something. So we had each, on the two conditions, MDMA and placebo, they had a, three positive memories and three very negative memories. And then we looked at the subjective impact of the drug on those memories. And you see on the left-hand side, the red bars are MDMA, and you can see that, as you might imagine, the <laughs> predict that the emotionality, the vividness, and the positivity of the positive memories were all enhanced by MDMA, because and that's one of the reasons people like it. But when we looked at the worst, the negative memories, we saw particularly the, 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 the emotion and vividness wasn't changed, but the negativity, the negative affect of the negative memories was attenuated. And that's, again, something we would want in a medicine that might help treat people with PTSD, because we know that one of the great challenges of dealing with PTSD, and in fact, maybe the major challenge, is having is, is getting people to get cognitive control over these the emotional responses to the negative memories. And uh, if you can't do that, and they break through to consciousness on a regular basis, then your life is disrupted, and you have PTSD. So we thought this was also a, a useful um, discovery. It helps make sense of why MDMA might be therapeutic in that kind of um, psychotherapeutic exposure therapy that the Mitthoffers were using. And we were then able to look at connectivity analysis, looking at the relationship of uh, and the amygdala and the connectivity to other brain regions. And you can see here that there was an attenuated connect. Overall, we, it doesn't just dampen down the amygdala, but it dampens down connectivity with other brain regions. There are no regions uh, where the amygdala is connected to that you're enhanced following MDMA, but these, these lateral parietal regions and, uh, and the insula perhaps here, are that connectivity with the amygdala is dampened down, which again fits with the idea that the amygdala is less able to orchestrate a full-blooded uh, emotional um, fear response. We're also particularly interested in this medial prefrontal region because there's a lot of data, some PET studies, old PET studies in Yale, now probably about 30 fMRI studies, suggesting that the me this medial prefrontal cortical region here is critical in regulating access to autobiographical memories. And here you see a deficiency of the GABA system in that um, part of the prefrontal cortex. And you see synchronously alterations in um, the fMRI, the bold signal in this region. When people are with PTSD are reliving their symptoms, and not, not everyone with PTSD gets this, but a significant proportion do. It's probably related to a failure of inhibition here, which presumably has got something to do with to suppress the emotional elements of the memory. So we looked at this particular region, and uh, we looked at the connectivity here, and what we saw, oops, sorry, what we saw was that there is a, a significant decoupling. Here's the seed region here, the medial prefrontal region. There's a decoupling, and particularly in this, this circuit here, you see the posterior cingulate. This is part of what we call the default mode. It's the, it's the cell circuit in the brain. So again, a, a reduction in uh, activity of a system which we believe to be abnormally overactive in PTSD. So why don't we use MDMA for PTSD? Well, I just wanted to share with you the challenges of doing this research. It, it, took, it took nearly 3,000 emails between me and my, and my university to get permission to do this study. It, we had to go to the, actually to the chair of the university council to be allowed to do a study with MDMA because Imperial College was terrified that it was going to get bad press for using an illegal drug. Uh, and then after we did it, the day after, and uh, this study was uh, shown, and it was shown on TV. It was actually a very popular TV program. 
we got this. We got a member of parliament who was actually a microbiologist who actually asked under parliamentary privilege, why was Professor Nutt allowed to use an illegal drug in a scientific study? I mean, if ever there was a, an absurd question raised in the British Parliament, that's got to be it. <laughs> and, uh, and you can say, he, well, he went on, what licenses were held for the drugs used? What's the process for revoking such licenses? And how would this process be initiated? I mean, basically he's saying, we shouldn't have done this study because it was an illegal drug. And he wants to get rid of my license to do the study. Mm. And uh, that just emphasizes the- Can I follow this? <coughs> Say again. No, no, go ahead. So, well, we haven't given up our license. In fact, we got it reinstated and uh, renewed. And based on those, uh, the Mitthofer studies, there are two now, and based on the fact that MAPS, the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies, is doing a major multi-center trial of MDMA in PTSD in the USA, and also I think they're going to move into Europe fairly soon, and I think Eric's is going to be one of the sites. We thought, well, where else could we use MDMA? And, and uh, at the, so Ben at the time, Ben Sasset at the time, was working in an addiction service. And it, it was very clear to him that many, many alcoholics are drinking to suppress traumatic memories. So we thought, well, maybe we could help their alcoholism if we, uh, if we treated the trauma. So we basically replicated the Mitthofer study, but this was an open study. We didn't have enough money to do a double blind study. An open study, a safety study, but, and it had to be at some sense a safety study because no one had ever given MDMA to people who were quite ill. Alcoholics are probably the illest group of people we ever work with. So we decided to replicate the Mitthofer study, but this time use alcoholics who had recently been detoxified, withdrawn, and we put them through a 12-week abstinence-based program during which they had two MDMA treatment sessions in the same way as the Mitthofer's with the same dose, 125 milligrams. And, uh, and the good news is that they all tolerated it very well. Only one person had slightly elevated blood pressure, despite being you know, often relatively ill people having come off a, a serious um, bout of drinking. And the results were really quite remarkable. And, and this is, this paper is under review at present. Uh, and what it shows is the, the red bars are the, are the people who went through the MDMA treatment. And the blue bars are the individuals, this is an audit of our standard abstinence-based 12-week treatment program. So you can see we don't do very well. This is average alcohol units per week, and a unit is eight grams, 10 milliliters of alcohol. So, so here you see, you know, these before they went into the study, the detox, they're drinking about 15 liters of alcohol a week, and then they stop drinking because they're detoxed. And you can see by six months, they've gone back to drinking as much as they were before. And that's because almost all of them relapse. And that just happens to be the way it is with alcoholics. Whereas the uh, MDMA treaty, they were drinking about 13 liters before they came in, they were detoxed to zero. And look, you can see the very profound reduction in consumption going up to six months. So this is, a, this is basically only two or two to three, depending on the time of these individuals relapse, whereas almost all of these relapse. So this is an enormously powerful impact of MDMA to- How many MDMA uh, sessions was that, David? Two, two MDMA sessions in the standard way. Um, one uh, about three weeks apart during the 12 week therapy. Okay. And I want to finish by saying a little bit about other psychedelics because there's also considerable interest in, in these direct acting uh, psychedelics rather than MDMA, which is a serotonin release. So these drugs all target the serotonin receptor, particularly the serotonin 2A receptor. And, uh, and of course, LSD is a semi synthetic derivative of ergot, which is the most well-known and the most powerful of the psychedelics. And uh, a few years ago, we started doing brain imaging studies on psilocybin and LSD. And at that time, I was very concerned about putting people into those trials who had any anxiety. Uh, and we did a depression study. And again, the, 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 the people that did less well most people did well, but the people who did less well were anxious people. 
So I was always rather skeptical about or fearful of using psychedelics for PTSD. But then veterans started talking to us. Uh, and in fact, last year a film was made. The film's called From Shock to Awe. And it's a remarkable film about American military veterans treating their PTSD with ayahuasca mm. and one with MDMA. And uh, in fact, if you're interested, there are three podcasts that I did recently um, on this with some of the people who were part of that um, treatment program. So we, now we have something which I was a surprise to me that you could use ayahuasca, which is a, a liquid drink that is actually contains DMT and an agent that prevents the breakdown of DMT. So it's an oral form of DMT, psilocybin. And, and they were using these psychedelics to treat their PTSD. And that made me think, well, how could that work? You know, it's what, what's going on? Why? I can understand why they might work in other disorders like depression. And uh, just recently, we put together a, a review that tries to make sense out of all this. And, and I'm just very briefly uh, to summarize what is actually going on when you take a, take a psychedelic. Psychedelics stimulate these are the, the receptor, the 5-HC2A receptor, and these are heavily expressed in this part of the brain. So here's that anterior, medial anterior cortex. This is the cingulate cortex. This part of the brain is the, the, the default mode network, which is the key part of the brain for regulating your sense of self. And what psychedelics do is they produce a profound activation of neurons in layer five of the cortex, producing a state of high entropy. They disrupt rhythmic brain activity. And by doing that, they switch the brain from a state of uh, a very synchronized ac peripheral activity to a much more hyper-connected state. And we believe that disruption from this state to this state allows people to break out of conditions like depression. And it may be that's how psychedelics help people break out of conditions like, like PTSD, where you get into a, a mode of thinking which becomes overlearned and repetitive. And we did a trial in depression, and this was people with depression. They'd all failed on two previous drug treatments. They'd all failed on CBT. And everyone got somewhat better. And some people are cured. And then some people have stayed cured for the rest of their life so far. And others, are, the depression has come back. But this is just an example of how you can get kind of life-changing alterations in uh, mental symptoms and mental disorders as a result of just a single dose of a psychedelic. Mm -hmm. So all I would say now is I think there's enough anecdotal evidence from the ayahuasca and now psilocybin treatments of veterans, self-treatment, self that we really should be thinking about doing trials in PTSD. And I think it would gain, that would be a very, it very interesting for this network to consider setting up such a trial. And I'll thank the team that did the work I talked about and uh, I'll take questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for, for sharing this uh, this. Is wonderful news, and actually, actually, it's been it's been the pharmaceutical industry that for years have uh, supported this and thinking in tricyclics and SSRI, and now we're going back to older compounds to to reinvent these serotonergic uh, compounds that we already had in our hands, yeah. but um, quote unquote forgot or so. It, th Rep thank you. Repressed, not forgot. Not repressed. Yes, that's the better word. Now we are going a little bit over time, and we're not oh, right. off by by Zoom or so. And and uh, maybe a couple of questions or so. We still have uh, the majority of the people that are on board. If I may just ask the first one, one David, because we we are seeing this uh, renaissance in psychedelics also within the domain of psychedelic assisted psychotherapy. Now, now that's also something new. And wh what do you think that the contribution or so of this assistive psychotherapy to the use of psychedelics is or so? Just give you some insight or reflection on the relative uh, contribution to the therapy. Great question. And of course, never studied. Um, so, you know, we do have evidence from basically surveys we do of people who self-medicate, who go on retreats, who, who just do trips. We do, we've got measures of mood changes before and after. So you can clearly get some benefit in well-being uh, just by taking the drugs alone. Uh, but we don't recommend that because we think you can certainly maximize and, and, and optimize the, the benefits mm. by having a therapist present. And we, there's a lot of therapy in this. I mean, there's, there's a preparation for the trip. There's a being there during the trip. And there's also um, being present after the trip. So it actually becomes quite an 
expensive therapy and that's probably going to be one of the limitations in rolling it out mm. what's very interesting about the veteran story and that film is a remarkable film because it seems it veterans and and, and it, i suppose this makes sense because of what the nature of of being in the military is, is that they do better if they're in groups like platoons you know because that's how they you that's how you work in the field you support each other in the field and and when they, if they go to these uh, ayahuasca tri treatments, they often find two or three other vets there and together they kind of form a, a sort of auto therapeutic group. Uh, and I think that's, that may actually be the most powerful way of all, it might be to have a really strong <coughs> therapist plus two or three people who have mm. a similar kind of experience supporting each other. Mm. Thank you, thank you. Any other questions at this moment um, from, from uh, let me look at the chat if there's a question. Not at the chat, but maybe um, uh, I, I saw you hesitate, Emily. Are, are you thinking of a question or did you have one in mind? No, just thought I found it really interesting and really interesting to just push David on the mechanisms in the mm. future because mechanisms can be both psychological, biological, as you know, mm -hmm. um, to try and at the moment the psychotherapy sounds a bit like a black box and I think it can be fractionated into no, processes. That's really great. That's what needs to happen. What we need, look, I can tell you categorically, the psychopharmacologists are interested in and possibly even convinced. <laughs> what we've got to do is we've got to get psychologists interested <laughs> so that they can start exploring those mechanisms. And that's, that's, that is the real challenge because, you know, it's to some extent, this is challenging to traditional psychotherapy. I don't, I don't think it is challenging particularly. Right. I think more the, 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 the question, it's about the question, why would this be more useful yeah. when we have, when we see the response rates we do see in good therapies, what is mm. this adding yeah. um, and how can we do it? So I think it's about pulling back and having a much wider discussion based on the kind of bigger evidence-based guidelines and then it becomes scientifically really interesting. So maybe yeah. what happens needs to happen is a different sort of discussion that would bring fields together. Totally, no, I mean, I, I, look, I'm, we're desperately trying to recruit psychologists to come and work with us, but the traditional mode of psychological thinking is often anti-drug. And therefore, you know, if they're, you know, our right. you know, psychology, trainee psychologists in Britain kind of think, oh, I don't want to go where drugs are going. But, but this isn't a drug, this is a, this is a psychotherapeutic aid. It's not so one drug. thing that might be helpful is we wrote a position paper in 2018 that talks about the notion of combination treatments across modalities. I don't know if you've read that, Dave. I certainly David. haven't, but I, I will if you send so it to may me. I after. warmly recommend that as it's Lance Psychiatry and people like Kath Harmer who are really good at working across modalities because yeah. I think it goes both ways. It's not drug or psychotherapy just as it's yeah. not Thank any you. of those without a real world or a social construct, yeah. but maybe both groups need to kind of laze and have a framework. Mm -hmm. So. It's yep. a Lancet Psychiatry paper, again, a big commission with many, many authors, but where there's a whole section on the idea of more logically and rationally thinking about combination approaches. And, and that might be a really nice way to meet towards a shared goal, rather than, as you say, have some very ancient, out of date, this versus that kind of thinking. Yeah, Maybe absolutely. you could no. in the, in the, the, the reference to that in the chat, uh, Emily. Uh, David, I had a question. Isaac, I saw that you waved your hand. Yeah, go ahead. So, so I have a, maybe a, sort of the opposite question to Emily. So, so I've been working with on, on the digital measurement and to some degree, you know, digital therapeutics and on the question of all these new generation of treatments that are coming out that are, uh, you know, uh, previously highly regulated, um, um, you know, uh, you know, um, typically require, you know, rapid acting and require right now uh, therapeutic interaction with, you know, you know, like kind of a, an in-depth, uh, uh, um, you know, uh, a treatment to go with, with the administration. So for instance, in the U.S., you know, there, there's some uh, use of, of psychedelics, but you need to do it with a therapist, at, you know, um, at a treatment center, and that's not uh, highly accessible to most people, you know, so sort of clusters in California and a couple other areas. And a number of, uh, you know, biotechs and pharmaceutical companies are interested in developing these, these, these compounds, have expressed a lot of interest in how can we bring that out into the real world so that these treatments can be more scalable. Mm -hmm. And that's a very tough question I've been thinking because the, the therapeutic relationship is, seems to be so important and creating sort of a digital analog seems too simplistic. I'm really curious about your thought about the scale of these treatments. How can we really bring them out, you know, in a way that isn't, um, I guess, you know, half-assed? <laughs> you know, oh, well, well it's, <clears throat> you know, it's something that concerns us a lot because if, if it turns out that it, if it turns out that the 
regulators insist on a particular intensity and of therapy and, and a particular number currently we use two therapists in each session right it could just be beyond uh, certainly beyond what the nhs is prepared to pay for so the, so there are several possible ways of moving one is to have only one therapist although i'm you know i'm slightly hesitant about that you know, you know if someone has a bad trip and starts to try to leave the room etc you know, it might be tricky because they're a big person and a little therapist uh the alternative is to try to do it in groups so that you might, and that's typically what happens in ayahuasca retreats. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the four or five, six, seven, eight people are dosed, and there may be one or two people there uh, facilitating. So that might be another way. Um, of course, the other way that, that some people are quite interested in is the concept of microdosing. So sub, lots of sub psychedelic doses to get to the same effect. I'd be very surprised if that works. But mm -hmm. to the same extent, I think it might work a bit. But I'd be surprised if it worked to the same extent. A question, the challenge of scalability rather than actually efficacy. A question I directed to you, Isaac, because I was assuming that for these treatment effects, you could use probably digital monitoring to predict on who's going to respond when or so. With these profound signals, it's not that you have a little bit of a signal, you have a profound signal. And you see, and these signals are immediately present, but it would be nice and great if these, um, these new digital um, phenotypes or so, or digital. Um, ways of assessing uh, facial and affect and, and stuff could be could be helpful in, in this new domain as well. Oh yeah, I mean absolutely. So you know David when I was looking at your data I was thinking how exciting it would be to look at some of these parameters like voice and facial features that you know we know would be affected. Um, you know on top of that the really you know so we've had a number of people talk to me about how you can monitor but the really tricky thing on top of that is how do you do something you know and and so you know in the US for instance, where, you know, the, the lower SES, you, the lower socioeconomic status you have, the less access you have to treatment. So there's all these exciting treatments coming out, and there's going to be a huge access gap, you know, and, and the question is, how can technology solve that? But, but at the same time, you know, it, it ain't so simple, <laughs> you know, the, the, the relationship, the treatment is, is complicated it's for a reason, and that, I think this is an unsolved problem. I mean, the good news is it does seem, and we've just finished our second depression trial. I showed you our, the Mithoffer data. I didn't show you the, well, the, on our alcohol study, they were, everyone was absent all the way through, so there was no relapse during the trial. But it does seem as if one treatment might be as good, almost as good as two. Oh, interesting, yeah. So that actually, that cuts the price. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think, you know, I mean, can we, say, uh, let's say, give this, this compound, see the effect, and then see who is going to respond? You know, I mean, basically based on, on the immediate effect. Yeah. This is, you know, another approach that we can see, and not, not necessarily follow up, but use it, you know, use the difference between pre and post to predict who, which one we should continue, which one there is no hope. No, yeah. it's, 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 do that selection uh, pr prospectively. So, you know, if, you, if you're saying, you know, what we're doing is we're ramping up serotonin, we would say, who are the people who are have low serotonergic tone? Could we identify those and then match the treatment? As yeah. a, you know, depression is so heterogeneous. Same thing with PTSD. You know, what is the mechanism that's relevant for that individual and then match them? And, and, and then you can have some return on investment. You could say, this is somebody who would respond to this treatment. So there is a reason to give them that as opposed to something else. Yeah, yeah. well, we've been trying to persuade the Medical Research Council of Britain to give us money so we could actually see whether amygdala hyperreactivity to faces was a proxy for serotonin. Mm. But they, uh, they, they, they've failed several times and I've given out writing grants to do that now. But that's the kind, that's a, that's a low sort of middle tech. And maybe your low tech stuff would be a lot better if you could actually show me a facial algorithm that predicted serotonin. I think, and if you think you could, then let us know because we aren't doing challenges, serotonergic challenges, all the time. Mm -hmm. so if you if you've got to, if you think you could do that, if it's easy enough just to take a video of someone's face during it, then we'll be very happy to get the data to you because mm. you know that that would, that could be cheap enough to make it viable on the NHS. Well, Dave, what you're saying is very exciting to me, so I'm going to email you offline because uh, I, I think I have a good answer to that question, and I'd be very excited about it. Great. Great.
Great. Now, j just one question to Emily, to you, maybe in response to David or so. This COVID crisis and the impact that the pandemic has or so, do you think there's any relation to resurgence or so of interest in these psychedelics or are they completely not associated or so? I heard people <laughs> comment on this, that this might, <laughs> might reinforce one another. That's a question I'd never thought about, Eric, and I think David would probably be a better um, person to answer that. I, I haven't, it hasn't occurred to me that there's been any link between the pandemic and psychedelics, but, but I, I think history will tell. Well, psychedelics aren't causing it, I can tell you that. No, I, I, that's, that can, we can rule it out as one of the conspiracy are, are they protective? Unknown. Um, have I got a lot of people asking me for treatment because of the COVID? Yes. Would I treat them? Probably not. It, I think actually they're very interesting. Here's an experiment. It, it's a really interesting experiment, which we never get funding for. But no, last word from you, David. So we should do this. This is an experiment I would like to do. You, you know, let's take 40 people who have had COVID and have got depression as a result of COVID, you know, proven COVID, and they'll have the brain changes from the virus causing depression. An equivalently matched group of 40 people, probably healthcare professionals who've been traumatized by having to do what they've got to do in, with the lack of equipment in a situation where they're, they're getting PTSD from being in the wrong place and, 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 and under the life-threatening circumstances, but they've not had COVID. But they've still got depression. <laughs> and I, bet, I bet that the, the, the people who got COVID brain damage wouldn't respond to psychedelics, but the ones who had the, the sort of the psychologically induced depression probably would. Here's a grand proposal, right? Yeah, but uh, yeah, I'll just never get it. You got the patent on this? Everyone hates <laughs> Listen, we, you know, in, we've been doing this for, this for 15 years. You know, we've only got one grant in 15 years from any grant giving body to do this psychedelics because they just, it, it's, they're all illegal drugs. You know, and everyone's terrified of being associated with illegality.